Okay, today is the 14th of August, uh, 2010, and we come to Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 64, Maha Malunkya Sutta, the greater discourse to Malunkya Putta. This sutta is also another very important sutta. Uh, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Pebble Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said, Monks, do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? When this was said, the Venerable Malunkya Buddha replied, Pebble Sir, I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. But Malunkya Buddha, in what way do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? Venerable Sir, I remember identity view as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember doubt as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember adherence to rules and observances as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember sensual desire as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. I remember ill will as a lower factor taught by the Blessed One. It is in this way, Venerable Sir, that I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. And the Buddha said, Malunkya Putta, to whom do you remember my having taught these five lower fetters in that way? Would not the wonders of other sects confute you with the simile of the infant? For a young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion identity. So how could identity view arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to identity view lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion teachings. So how could doubt about teachings arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to doubt lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion rules. So how could adherence to rules and observances arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to adhere to rules and observances lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion sensual pleasure. So how could sensual desire arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to sensual lust lies within him. A young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion beings. So how could ill will towards beings arise in him? Yet the underlying tendency to ill will lies within him. Would not the wonders of other sects confute you with this simile of the infant? I'll stop here for a moment. So when Malunkya Putta quoted the five lower factors, the Buddha said, if you say that it's the five lower factors, then wonders of other sects, external ascetics, can prove you wrong, confute you with the simile of the infant. Uh, saying that the infant, uh, a young infant, uh, does not have the, these five uh, lower factors. Uh, yet, uh, the tendency uh, to have these five lower factors is there. Uh, um, later, the Buddha explains uh, that uh, by factor he means uh, it is a factor only if it habitually obsesses a person. Uh, Thereupon, the Venerable Ananda said, It is time, Blessed One, it is a time, Sublime One, for the Blessed One to teach the five lower factors. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. The Blessed One said, Here, Ananda, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, abides with the mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view, and he does not understand as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. And when that identity view has become habitual and is uneradicated in him, it is a lower factor. Similarly, he abides with the mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt by adherence to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will, and he does not understand the escape as it actually is uh, from the arisen factors. And when that factor has become habitual and uneradicated in him, it is a lower factor. Uh, 
stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha explains huh? this uh, factor huh? when uh, the mind is obsessed huh? by these factors and, and it is habitual. Huh? Uh, so the person is habitually uh, obsessed huh? by these uh, five things. Huh? Then it becomes a factor for him. Huh? A well taught noble disciple, Aryan, huh? who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not abide with the mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view. He understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view, and identity view together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him. Similarly, he does not abide with the mind obsessed and enslaved by doubt, by adherence to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will, and he understands as it actually is the escape from arisen factor, from the arisen factor, and the factor together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him. Uh, so, uh, stop here for a moment. So, for the Aryan disciple, uh, uh, he understands the Dhamma, the Aryan Dhamma, the Dhamma of true men, uh, and these uh, five lower factors uh, uh, is abandoned. Even the underlying tendency uh, to it is abandoned. There is a path, Ananda, a way to the abandoning of the five lower factors, that anyone without coming to that path, to that way, shall know or see or abandon the five lower factors. This is not possible. Just, and just as when there is a great tree standing possessed of hardwood, it is not possible that anyone shall cut out its hardwood without cutting through its bark and sapwood. So too there is a path. Uh, there is a path, Ananda, a way to the abandoning of five lower factors. As someone, by coming to that path, to that way, shall know and see and abandon the five lower factors. This is possible. This is when there is a great tree standing possessed of hard wood. It is possible that someone shall cut out its hard wood by cutting through its bark and sap wood. So too there is a path uh, for the abandoning of the five lower factors. Stop here. So here the Buddha says, uh, just as if you want to extract uh, the hard wood uh, of a tree, uh, which is at the core of the tree, the center of the tree, uh, you have to cut through the bark uh, and the sap wood and the soft wood uh, before you can take out the hard wood. Uh, uh. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, to abandon the five lower factors, uh, there is a specific path. Uh, and if you don't walk that specific path, uh, it is impossible uh, to abandon the five lower factors. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water right up to the brim so that crows could drink from it. And then a feeble man came thinking, by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges. Yet he would not be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dhamma is being taught to someone for the cessation of identity, if his mind does not enter into it and acquire confidence, steadiness and decision, then he can be regarded like the feeble man. Suppose Ananda, the river Ganges were full of water right up to the brim, so that crows could drink from it. And then a strong man came, thinking, by swimming across the stream with my arms, I shall get safely across to the further shore of this river Ganges, and he would be able to get safely across. So too, when the Dhamma is being taught to someone for the cessation of, his, of identity, if his mind enters into it and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision, then he can be regarded as like the strong man. Sorry for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha says, nah, just like a weak man nah, is, uh, cannot swim across the Ganges nah, because it is quite a wide river, but a strong man can. Nah. So in the same way, the Buddha says, nah, when the Dhamma is taught, nah, if a person nah, does not pay full attention nah, and uh, if the mind does not enter into it uh, and acquire confidence, steadiness and decision, uh, then he can be regarded like the feeble man. Uh, he cannot achieve uh, what he aims to do. Uh, uh. Whereas the other person, uh, uh, if he listens to the Dhamma uh, and the mind enters into it and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision, uh, then he can be regarded like the strong man uh, who can swim across the river. Uh. So 
listening to the Dhamma with careful attention, uh, full attention, uh, and understanding the Dhamma is very important. And what Ananda is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Here, with seclusion from objects of attachment, with the abandoning of unwholesome states, with a complete tranquilization of bodily inertia, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. Whatever exists therein of material form, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not self. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element thus. This is the peaceful, this is the sublime, that is the stilling of all volitions, the relinquishing of all attachments, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. Standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, with the destruction of the five lower factors, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the path uh, which is absolutely necessary uh, to the abandonment of the five lower factors uh, starts with the first jhana. Buddha says, uh, when a person attains the first jhana, then he can see uh, that the five aggregates, uh, basically the body and the mind, are impermanent, suffering, a disease, a tumor, a barb, a calamity, etc. Then uh, it becomes um, uh, dispassionate uh, and uh, relinquishes uh, all craving uh, towards the body and the mind, uh, basically the self then only he can attain uh, Nibbāna. And if he does not, nah, then because of the understanding of the Dhamma, he will become an Anagamin nah, and be reborn in the Sudhavasa heavens, the pure abodes, nah, and from there attain Nibbāna. Nah. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. Uh, again, with the fading away as well of, of delight, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. Uh, so this second jhana also is the path to the to the abandoning of the five lower factors. The third jhana also is the path to the abandonment of the five lower factors. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, the monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and, pure, and purity of mindfulness and equanimity. Uh, whatever exists therein of material form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he, so, he sees those states as impermanent as suffering, etc. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. This again is a path, the way to, to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, etc. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. This again is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, where the consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. Similarly, whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, etc., and turns his mind away from those states. Uh, this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that, that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. Whatever exists therein of feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, he sees those states as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, etc. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element. 
uh, standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, with the destruction of the five lower factors, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes, and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is the path, this is the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors. And Malunkya put uh, this member. Ananda said, Humble sir, if this is the path, the way to the abandoning of the five lower factors, then how is it that some monks here are said to gain liberation by mind and some are said to gain liberation by wisdom? And the Buddha said, the difference here, Ananda, is in the faculties, I say. That is what the Blessed One said. Humble Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this last part, now, nah, the Buddha confirms uh, that there are two types of liberation. One is liberation by mind, and another one is liberation by wisdom. But basically they are the same. Uh. It is not the, that the method is different. The method is both are the same. Uh, that is basically the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. But the difference why one uh, gains liberation by mind, uh, another one gains liberation by wisdom, the Buddha says, uh, is because there's a difference in the faculties. Uh. We find from the Sutta that uh, those Arahans uh, who were liberated uh, during meditation, uh, like the Buddha himself, uh, uh, they are said to be liberated by mind. And there are, there are two Suttas uh, which talks about the two types of Arahans. One Sutta says uh, there is an Arahan liberated by mind. Later I can give you the, the, the Sutta reference. Uh, there's one liberated by mind and the other is liberated by wisdom. And there is another sutta that says there are two types of arahans. One who is two ways liberated or both ways liberated uh, and another one is liberated by wisdom. Uh, so this means uh, the monk who is liberated by mind uh, is also the monk who is two ways liberated. Uh, when a monk is two ways liberated, uh, it means uh, he is liberated by mind and by wisdom. Because without wisdom, uh, you cannot attain liberation. It's just that uh, liberation by mind, uh, actually from the suttas we find, uh, are those who meditate uh, using the strength of mind. Uh, they meditate uh, and then after that, uh, they attain enlightenment like the Buddha. And there are others, uh, uh, like Venerable Sariputta, he was listening to a discourse by the Buddha. And uh, during the, the hearing of the discourse, uh, he understood uh, and he became uh, arhan, became liberated. Uh, so this uh, liberation by wisdom uh, uh, is uh, not during meditation. But somebody like Venerable Sariputta, you can see in Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 111, uh, he has all the jhanas, uh, all the jhanas. Uh, it's not that people who are liberated by wisdom uh, do not have jhanas. There is a commentarial uh, uh, idea, uh, a lot of things. Uh, uh, in the commentaries, uh, contradict the suttas. Uh. So here, from this sutta, what is very important uh, is that uh, to attain the uh, abandoning of the five lower factors, when you abandon the five lower factors, uh, you become an anagamin, a third fruit, arya. Uh. So here you can see, uh, uh, without uh, the jhanas I uh, mentioned here, uh, it is impossible uh, to abandon the five lower factors and become an anagamin. Uh, so there are some other suttas uh, where the Buddha says, uh, for anagamin, attainment of anagamin, third fruit uh, and arahanhood, uh, fourth fruit, uh, you need uh, the four jhanas. Perfect samadhi, perfect concentration in the Buddha's teachings uh, are the four jhanas. Uh, uh, and uh, for the others, like uh, uh, sakadagamin, the second fruit, uh, uh, you don't need perfect uh, concentration. You don't need the four jhanas, but you may need the you you, you may need to get uh, the first jhana or the second jhana or the third jhana uh, before you can become a saka the uh, uh, But for the uh, third and fourth, uh, you need four jhanas. Uh, so in, in because of this uh, this point, uh, I say this sutta is very important. That it's impossible to become an anagamin or uh, arahana without the jhanas. Now we come to Sutta 65, Padali Sutta. Thus have I heard. One occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaita's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. 
There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, noble sir, they replied, the blessed one said, Monks, I eat at a single session. By so doing, I am free from illness and affliction, and I enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come, monks, eat at a single session. By so doing, you too will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy health, strength, and a comfortable abiding. When this was said, the Venerable Badali told the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I am not willing to eat at a single session, for if I were to do so, I might have worry and anxiety about it. Then the Buddha said, Then Badali, eat one part there where you are invited, and bring away one part to eat. By eating in that way, you will maintain yourself. Venerable Sir, I am not willing to eat in that way either, for if I were to do so, I might also have worry and anxiety about it. Then when this training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, the Venerable Badali publicly declared in the Sangha of Monks his unwillingness to undertake the training. Then the Venerable Badali did not present himself to the Blessed One for the whole of that three-month period of the rains, as he did not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. Stop here for a moment. So, uh, the Buddha, at this time of the Sutta, he wanted the monks to eat only one meal a day. Uh, and you can see from here, the Buddha says uh, he eats uh, uh, at a single session or a single sitting and uh, eats one meal a day. And he's healthy. And uh, there are some monks like this, Venerable Badali, uh, they were not uh, willing uh, to follow this uh, uh, precept. Uh, and uh, so, so in front of everyone, uh, he declared uh, his unwillingness uh, to follow the Buddha's instructions. Uh, uh. So because of that, uh, he avoided the Buddha uh, for the three months of the Vasa, uh, the rains period, uh, uh, rains retreat. Uh. Initially, the Buddha allowed, uh, did not make this precept, uh, and the uh, monks could, could eat as many times as they wanted. Uh. Later, the Buddha said, uh, uh, instead of three meals, they should only take two meals. Uh. And then later, he said, uh, only one meal, uh, like here. Uh. But because of monks like this, Venerable Badali, uh, not willing to eat one meal, uh, he said, uh, you can eat your main meal, uh, and then uh, you can take part of it if you if you uh, if you if you want uh, you can keep part of that uh, food uh, to eat uh, again uh, but uh, it must be in the morning uh, between dawn and noon dawn is when the sun arises and noon is when the sun is at the highest point in malaysia it will be like 7 a.m. until 1 p.m. Uh, so uh, even even then, uh, this uh, Venerable Badali was not willing to follow uh, this uh, training uh, to eat only in the morning. Uh. Now on that occasion, a number of monks were engaged in making up a robe for the Blessed One, thinking, with his robe completed at the end of the three months of the rains, the Blessed One would set out wondering. Then the Venerable Badali went to those monks and exchanged greetings with them. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. When he had done so, they said to him, Friend Badali, this robe is being made up for the Blessed One. With this robe completed at the end of the three months of the rains, the Blessed One will set out wondering, Please, friend Badali, give proper attention to your declaration. Do not let it become more difficult for you later on. Stop here for a moment. So here, uh, these monks were... Uh, very good. Uh, they uh, were very considerate. Uh, they told Venerable Badali, uh, please, uh, friend, uh, 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 don't make things difficult for you later on. Uh, in other words, they are hinting to him uh, to go and apologize to the Buddha. Uh, otherwise, uh, this will be an obstruction for him uh, later. If he still wants to continue as a monk, uh, this will be a big obstruction. Uh, Yes, friends, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said, Remember, sir, a transgression overcame me, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when the training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, I publicly declared in the Sangha of monks my unwillingness to undertake the training. Remember, sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such, for the sake of restraint in the future. 
And the Buddha said, surely Badali, a transgression overcame you in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of monks your unwillingness to undertake the training. Badali, this circumstance was not recognized by you. The Blessed One is living at Savati, and the Blessed One will know me thus. The monk named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many monks who have taken up residence at Savati for the rains, and they too will know me thus. The monk named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance too was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many bhikkhunis have taken up residence at Savati for the rains. Uh, many nuns uh, have taken up residence at Savati for the rains. And they too will know me thus. The monk named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance too was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many men lay followers, many women lay followers are staying at Savati, and they too will know me thus. The monk named Badali is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance too was not recognized by you. Also, this circumstance was not recognized by you. Many recluses and Brahmins of other sects have taken up residence at Savati for the rains, and they too will know me thus. The monk named Badali, an elder disciple of the recluse Gautama, is one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. This circumstance too was not recognized by you. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So the Buddha was admonishing him huh, after he uh, confessed huh, his wrong doing. Huh? The Buddha said, uh, you did not uh, foresee huh, that uh, you will have a very bad reputation. Huh? The, the Buddha will see you uh, as one uh, who refuses to train in the precepts and the, the, all the monks and the nuns uh, and all the men lay followers and women followers uh, all will recogni recognize you uh, as somebody, uh, as one of the monks uh, who does not uh, comply with the Buddha's uh, instructions uh, and even external ascetics uh, will also know you. Uh, in other words, you get a very bad reputation. Uh, all this was not seen by you. Uh. Second time he confessed, I like, said, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One. I publicly declared in the Sangha of monks my unwillingness to undertake the training. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, when the training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of monks your unwillingness to undertake the training. What do you think, Badali? Suppose a monk here were one liberated in both ways. Uh, and I told him, come monk, be a plank for me to walk across the mud. Would he walk across himself, or would he dispose his body otherwise? Or would he say no? No, venerable sir. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, the Buddha, uh, when he confessed the second time, uh, uh, the, the Buddha uh, still did not accept. Uh, the Buddha said, uh, uh, suppose there were an arahan uh, liberated in both ways. Uh, that means uh, mind liberated arahan. Uh, and I told him, uh, uh, Sleep in the mud lah, for me to walk across your body lah, so that my feet don't get dirty. Lah. Uh, would this Arahan lah, uh, refuse to do so lah, and walk across himself? Lah? Or would he turn his body another direction? Lah? Or would he say no? Lah? And then Verbal Badali said no. In other words, lah, he knows lah, when the Buddha will ask the Arahan to even sleep in the mud for him to use as a carpet to walk across, lah, that Arahan will quickly do so. Lah. Uh, this, this uh, uh, simile given here, uh, we know, uh, was used late by later monks uh, to create the story of the Pankara Buddha. Remember this story? Uh, they say a uh, long time ago, the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, was uh, ascetic by the name of Sumedha. Uh, and he, at that time, uh, this ascetic Sumedha, he met the Buddha, the Pankara. 
and the Buddha the Pankara was so how do you say awesome so uh, so he was so impressed by the uh, Buddha the Pankara that he willingly lay in the mud na, for the the Pankara Buddha to walk step across his body to walk across the mud na. Uh, and then according to this story after that na, uh, he, he altogether he met 24 Buddhas la, before he became the Buddha Sakyamuni la. Uh, you can see uh, that, that that story uh, was extracted from here la. Uh, but that story is a false story la. it was created by later monks la. Uh, so in the suttas the Buddha said uh, he looked into the past whole night he didn't sleep uh, he looked throughout the night uh, and he looked back 91 world cycles uh, he said he only saw uh, 6 Samasam Buddhas la. There's no such thing as 24 or 28 or 88 uh, Buddhas. La. It's only six Buddhas uh, in the suttas. La. There's a lot of wrong views uh, being taught nowadays. So unless you're familiar with the suttas, uh, you don't know all this. Uh. Then the Buddha continued. What do you think, Madali? Suppose a monk here were one liberated by wisdom. And then I told him, come monk, be a plan for me to walk across the mud. Would he walk across himself, or would he dispose his body otherwise, or would he say no? Again, remember the Padali said no. Uh, similarly, the Buddha uh, quoted uh, the body witness, Kaya Sakin, one attained to view, Ditipatta, one liberated by faith, Sadavi Mutta. Uh, Dhamma, uh, follower, faith, follower. Uh, and I told him, come monk, be a plan for me to walk across the mud. Would he walk across himself, or would he dispose his body otherwise, or would he say no, no verbal sir? So here the Buddha is talking about all the various types of Arya. If a person has become an Arya, he has unshakable faith in the Buddha. Uh, he worships the Buddha. And if the Buddha were to ask him to sleep in the mud, uh, for the Buddha to use as a carpet to walk across, uh, he would not hesitate. Uh, what do you think, Madali? Were you on that occasion one liberated in both ways, or one liberated by wisdom, or a body witness, or one attained to view, or one liberated by faith, or a Dhamma follower, or a faith follower? No, Rebel Sir. But Dali, on that occasion, were you not an empty, hollow wrongdoer? I'll stop here for a moment. So, Buddha said, uh, uh, when I gave the instruction and you refused, uh, you publicly uh, repudiated me uh, in front of everybody, uh, at that time were you an Arya? He said, no. And Buddha said, at that time, uh, you were just an empty, hollow wrongdoer. Yes, Venerable Sir. Venerable Sir, transgression overcame me in that like a fool, confused and blundering. When a training precept was being made known by the Blessed One, I publicly declared in the Sangha of monks my unwillingness to undertake the training. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such, for the, straight, for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Badali, a transgression overcame you in that like a fool, confused and blundering. When the training precept was being made known by me, you publicly declared in the Sangha of monks your unwillingness to undertake the training. But since you see your transgression as such and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such and makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma by undertaking restraint for the future. I'll stop here for a moment. So you see, only after the third time he asked for forgiveness, then only the Buddha forgave him. Here, Badali, some monk does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. He considers thus, suppose I were to resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, or the root of a tree, or a mountain, or a ravine, or a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. Perhaps I might realize a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the Aryans, noble ones. He resorts to some secluded resting place. While he lives there, thus withdrawn, the teacher censures him. Wise companions in the holy life who have made investigation censure him. God censure him, and he censures himself, being censured in this way by the teacher, by wise companions in the holy life, by gods and by himself. He realizes no superhuman state, no distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Why is that? That is how it is with one who does not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying, I suppose among the he wants to uh, meditate very hard. Nah? He goes to a secluded place, lives alone, nah? and he practices very hard. Nah? 
but he cannot make any progress. Why? Because he does not fulfill the training. Lah. He does not fulfill the, the training in the sila, moral conduct, lah, the precepts, lah, the um, concentration and the wisdom. Lah. Uh, and because of that, lah, uh, the, the, the teacher lah, uh, has a bad impression of him, lah, censures him. Lah. And other monks also criticize him. Lah. And he himself will criticize himself. Uh, and the gods uh, who can read his mind uh, will also censure him, uh, criticize him. So because of this uh, uh, conscience uh, pricking him, uh, he, his mind uh, cannot be happy uh, and attain concentration. Uh, from there, uh, he cannot attain the supernormal states, uh, superhuman states. Uh, uh. Here, Badali, some monk does fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. He considers thus, suppose I were to resort to a secluded resting place, the forest or the root of a tree or a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a channel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. Perhaps I might realize a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. He resorts to some secluded resting place. While he lives thus withdrawn, the teacher does not censure him. Wise companions in the holy life who have made investigation do not censure him. Gods do not censure him. And he does not censure himself. Being uncensured in this way by the teacher, by wise companions in the holy life, by gods and by himself, he realizes a superhuman state, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, the converse, if a monk uh, complies with all the training uh, in the precepts, uh, concentration and wisdom. Uh, then uh, he has no remorse. Uh, nobody censures him or uh, criticizes him. Uh, and he does not criticize himself. Uh, and so he can attain uh, what he wants to attain uh, because he, is, he has no remorse. He's full of happiness, uh, full of gladness. Uh, and the mind calms down. Uh, Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training and the teacher's dispensation. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, similarly with the fading away as well of delight. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training in the teacher's dispensation. When his concentrated mind is thus purified and bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. Thus, with the aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training in the teacher's dispensation. When his concentrated mind is thus purified and bright, attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training in the teacher's dispensation. When his concentrated mind is thus purified and bright, attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. He understands as it actually is, this is suffering. He understands as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering, the way leading to the, uh, 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 the, the cessation of suffering and the way leading to the cessation of suffering of the taints. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Why is that? That is how it is with one who fulfills the training in the teacher's dispensation. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, when a monk uh, fulfills the training uh, laid out by the Buddha, uh, then he can attain the four jhanas. Uh, and after he has attained the four jhanas, uh, you see here, the mind is purified and bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability. 
because the mind has come to that state, uh, then when he directs it uh, to the recollection of past lives, uh, he is able to do so. Uh, and when he recollects it to, uh, when he directs it uh, to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings, uh, he is also able to do so. Uh, and thirdly, uh, when he directs it uh, to the knowledge of the uh, Four Noble Truths uh, and the Asavas, uh, then he also understands uh, and attains liberation. Uh, so, uh, these uh, later, the three knowledges uh, is only possible uh, because the mind has attained the fourth jhana. After the fourth jhana, uh, it is uh, just right uh, because it is purified and bright, etc. Uh, Thereupon the Venerable Badali asks, Venerable Sir, what is the cause, what is the reason why they take action against some monk here by repeatedly admonishing him? What is the cause, what is the reason why they do not take such action against some monk here by repeatedly admonishing him? Here Badali, some monk is a constant offender with many offenses. When he is corrected by the monks, he prevaricates, leads the talk aside, shows disturbance hate and bitterness. He does not proceed rightly. He does not comply. He does not clear himself. He does not say, let me act so that the Sangha will be satisfied. Monks, taking account of this matter, uh, monks, taking account of this matter, think it would be good if the Venerable once examined this monk in such a way that this litigation against him is not settled too quickly. And the monks examine the monk in such a way that the litigation uh, against him is not settled too quickly. Uh, so this uh, monk uh, is uh, not only a constant offender, but when he is uh, advised by other monks uh, to correct his uh, behavior, uh, he prevaricates, uh, he talks about some other things, uh, and uh, he is disturbed, uh, he gets angry, and does not uh, comply with what they say. Uh, uh, he does not act in a way uh, that the other monks are happy. Uh. So because of that, uh, they, they, they keep uh, they repeatedly uh, uh, find fault with him. Uh. I guess this uh, wherever Badali must be a monk like this. Uh. So other monks uh, constantly find fault with him. Uh. That's why he's not happy complaining the Buddha. Uh, why this monk is always constantly finding fault with me. And then the Buddha says here again, But here, some monk is a constant offender with many offenses. When he is corrected by the monks, he does not prevaricate, lead the talk aside or show disturbance, hate and bitterness. He proceeds rightly, he complies, he clears himself, he says, Let me so act that the Sangha will be satisfied. Monks, taking account of this matter, think it would be good if the Venerable once examined this monk in such a way that this litigation against him is settled quickly. And the monks examine that monk in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly. Uh, stop here for a moment. So this another type of constant offender. Uh, he is uh, advised by other monks uh, to change, uh, and he listens to them. Uh, he does not get angry. Uh, he does not lead the talk aside, uh, and he complies with what they advise him. Uh, and so because of that, uh, the other monks. Uh, have sympathy for him la, and try to settle his case quickly. La, la. Here some monk is a chance offender without many offenses. When he is corrected by the monks, he prevaricates, leads the talk aside, or show disturbance, hate and bitterness, etc. La. And the monks examine that monk in such a way that the litigation against him is not settled too quickly. But here some monk is a chance offender without many offenses. When he is corrected by the monks, he does not prevaricate or lead the talk aside or show disturbance, etc. And the monks examine that monk in such a way that the litigation against him is settled quickly. Stop here for a moment. So this one is not a constant offender, but a chance offender. And the other monks, when they advise him to change, if the monk uh, is willing to change, uh, then they sympathize with him uh, and quickly settle his case. Uh. But he, but if he is the type uh, who is hard to correct, uh, then they, they constantly find fault with him. Uh. Here some monk progresses by a measure of faith and love. In this case, the monks consider thus. Friends, this monk progresses by a measure of faith and love. Let him not lose that measure of faith and love as he may if we take action against him by repeatedly admonishing him. Suppose a man had only one eye, 
Then his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, would guard his eye, thinking, let him not lose his one eye. So too, some monk progresses by a measure of faith and love. And they think, uh, let him not lose that measure of faith and love, as he may if we take ag action against him by repeatedly admonishing him. This is the cause, this is the reason why they take action against some monk here, by repeatedly admonishing him. This is the cause, this is the reason why they do not take such action against some monk here by repeatedly admonishing him. So this th last type of monk uh, is new, uh, but he has faith uh, and he has love. Uh, so because of that, uh, the other monks sympathize with him. Uh, uh. Remember, sir, what is the cause, what is the reason why there were previously fewer training rules and more monks became established in final knowledge? What is the cause, what is the reason why there are now more training rules and fewer monks become established in final knowledge? Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here he's asking uh, why formerly uh, there were less precepts made by the Buddha and there were more arahants. And nowadays uh, there are so many precepts uh, and we have less arahants. Uh. And the Buddha said, that is how it is Badali. And beings are deteriorating and the true Dhamma is disappearing. Then there are more training rules and fewer monks become established in final knowledge. The teacher does not make the training rule for disciples until certain things that are the basis for taints become manifest here in the Sangha. But when certain things that are the basis for taints become manifest here in the Sangha, then the teacher makes known the training rule for disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for taints. Those things that are the basis for taints do not become manifest here in the Sangha until the Sangha has reached greatness. But when the Sangha has reached greatness, then those things that are the basis for things become manifest here in the Sangha. And then the teacher makes known the training rule for disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for things. Those things that are the basis for things do not become manifest here in the Sangha until the Sangha has reached the acme of worldly gain, the acme of, fr of fame, the acme of great learning, the acme of long-standing renown. But when the Sangha has reached the acme of long-standing renown, etc., then those things that are the basis for things become manifest here in the Sangha. And then the teacher makes known the training rule for disciples in order to ward off those things that are the basis for things. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha answers uh, that uh, after some time, uh, the Sangha becomes very well established uh, and they become... Uh, uh, famous la. and they have reached the peak la. Uh, then when they have reached the peak la, then uh, problems start to appear la. here the Buddha says uh, uh, the things become manifest la. here refers to what Chinese call Fan Nao all the uh, uh, uncontrolled mental outflows la. that's my translation for things uh, the uh, Asavas, uncontrolled mental outflows. That means uh, uh, the the mind. Uh, they use the mind a lot uh, instead of uh, meditating and attain the jhanas. Uh, the monks, uh, after some time, uh, they become lax. Uh, after the sangha has reached uh, fame, uh, the, 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 the 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 peak, uh, then the the sangha of monks, uh, the Buddha and the sangha of monks, uh, become very famous. Uh, then they get a lot of offerings and all that. Uh, then the monks start to relax. Uh, and you get uh, bad eggs, uh, wrong, uh, the monks, uh, uh, people coming into monkhood for the wrong reasons. Uh, they wear the robe for the wrong reasons. Uh, and then uh, they don't practice. Uh, they don't practice. Uh, uh, they, they, they don't practice. Uh, they, they, the aim in wearing the robe uh, is not to practice the holy life. Uh, and they are the greedy for offerings and greedy for fame and all that. Uh, uh, so that's when the teens. Uh, uh, become manifest, uh, all this, uh, using their mind too much, uh, and beings are deteriorating, uh, and and the true Dharma starts to disappear, uh, because these monks, uh, instead of practicing, uh, meditating very hard, uh, and disciplining their mind, uh, and uh, not using their mind uh, in thinking, uh, they start to think a lot, uh, and then they have wrong interpretation of the Dharma, and they have wrong interpretation of the Dharma, and then the true Dharma starts to disappear, uh, it's like nowadays, uh, you have so many uh, different uh, uh, interpretations of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, 
uh, instead of sticking to the original Buddha's teachings uh, in the four Nikayas uh, plus a few books of the fifth Nikaya, they go and follow other books uh, like uh, we have the Mahayana and the Hinayana books. Uh, uh, so uh, all this uh, uh, causes the true Dhamma to disappear. Uh, and when this starts to happen, uh, then the Buddha uh, starts to make more and more rules. Uh, and then you get less and less uh, uh, arahants in the world. Uh, uh. And the Buddha said, There were few of you, but Dali, when I taught the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred coat, do you remember that, Badali? No, Venerable Sir. To what reason do you attribute that? Venerable Sir, I have long been one who did not fulfill the training in the teacher's dispensation. And the Buddha said, That is not the only cause or the only reason, but rather by encompassing your mind with my mind. I have long known you thus. When I am teaching that Dhamma, this misguided man does not heed it, does not give it attention, does not engage it with all his mind, does not hear the Dhamma with eager ears. Still, Badali, I will teach you the Dhamma through the simile of the young thoroughbred quote, Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Member Sir, the Member Badali replied. Uh, so, stop here for a moment. Uh, so, the Buddha says, uh, uh, there were a few of you around and when I gave the simile of the young thoroughbred coat, do you remember? He said, no. Uh, I see this uh, sati, uh, the definition of sati uh, is uh, being able uh, to remember what was said and done uh, a long time ago. Uh, so this, uh, remember Badali, uh, he does not have that sati, uh, his mind is not clear, uh, that's why he does not remember. Uh, and Buddha asked him, why don't you remember? He said, because I have not fulfilled the training, I have not followed the Buddha's instructions. The Buddha said, that is not the only reason. The Buddha said, I notice every time I am teaching the Dhamma, this foolish man does not pay attention, does not engage with all his mind, does not hear the Dhamma with eager ears. So, when the Dhamma is being taught, you have to pay full attention. If you are interested in the Dhamma, if you have the affinity with the Dhamma, every time the Dhamma is taught, you will not talk, you pay careful attention. There are some of you, when the Dhamma is spoken, you are talking and all that. So the Buddha says that just like just now he gave the simile of the man swimming across the river Ganges. If a man is very strong, he's able to swim the, across the river Ganges, that is similar to a man uh, when the Dhamma is taught, uh, he pays full attention. And the feeble man who is not able to swim across the Ganges uh, for the simple reason when the Dhamma is taught, uh, he does not is not interested, uh, he does not pay full attention. So listening to the Dhamma uh, is extremely important uh, in the Buddha's teaching, uh, not only meditation, it has to be combined uh, with listening to the Dhamma. The Blessed One said, Badali, suppose a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred coat. He first makes him get used to wearing the bit. While the coat is being made to get used to wearing the bit, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays some contortion, breathing and vacillation. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action. When the coat has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him get used to wearing the harness. While the coat is being made used, is being made to get used to wearing the harness, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays some contortion, breathing and vacillation. But through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in that action. When the coat has become peaceful in that action, the horse trainer further makes him act in keeping in step, in running in a circle, in prancing, in galloping, in charging, in the kingly qualities, in the kingly heritage, in the highest speed, in the highest fleetness, in the highest gentleness. While the court is being made to get used to doing these things, because he is doing something that he has never done before, he displays some contortion, breathing and vacillation, but through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in those actions. When the court has become peaceful in those actions, the horse trainer further rewards him with a rubbing down and a grooming. When a fine thoroughbred court possesses these ten factors, he is worthy of the king in the king's service and considered one of the factors of a king. Stop here for a moment. So the Buddha here gives a simile of the court 
uh, and he's being trained. Is uh, is uh, being trained a step at a time, uh, and uh, in the beginning, uh, when he starts something new, uh, he's not used to it. Uh, he will try to uh, rebel, uh, uh, contortion, rhythm, and all that. But uh, gradually, uh, he gets used to it. Uh, then he goes through different. Uh, steps uh, of the training uh, and eventually uh, he's worthy of the king, uh, becomes a king's horse. Uh, so in the same way, uh, the Buddha is trying to say, uh, when a person comes into monkhood, uh, there's a lot of things uh, that person is not used to, uh, uh, eating, uh, forsaking the dinner, uh, <laughs> forsaking the siu ye, supper, and uh, uh, not being able to uh, go and see shows, uh, do whatever you like. Uh, in the, uh, for a monk, uh, he stays in a monastery. He cannot go anywhere. Uh, uh, and when you are you are, you are restless, uh, you still cannot go anywhere. You just have to fight with your restlessness. Uh, mm. uh, some monks, uh, because of eating one meal a day, they have uh, uh, gastric problems. Uh, and they have to bear with it uh, until uh, they can uh, at least subdue it. Uh. And then a lot of other things, uh, so many precepts uh, you have to uphold. Uh, a lot of things, uh, you're not used to it. Uh, it takes a long time to get used to it, uh, just like the training of the coat. Uh, but uh, when you get used to it, uh, then you become, like here it says, the worthy of the king. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, then the Buddha, Buddha uh, similarly, uh, the Buddha says, So too, Badali, when a monk possesses ten qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What are the ten? Here, Badali, a monk possesses the right view of one beyond training, the right thoughts of one beyond training, the right speech of one beyond training, the right action of one beyond training, the right livelihood of one beyond training, the right effort of one beyond training, the right recollection of one beyond training, the right concentration of one beyond training, the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. When a monk possesses these ten qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Badali was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, uh, so here, uh, this simile uh, of uh, the training of a monk. Uh, so this uh, sutta is quite interesting. You can see here, if a person becomes an Arya, he would not hesitate uh, to do what is required uh, by the Buddha, we do not hesitate to follow the Buddha's instructions. Uh, and uh, so the Buddha says, uh, if a monk uh, follows the Buddha's instructions uh, and practices, uh, and then uh, he can attain the jhanas, uh, and after he attains the jhanas, uh, then uh, he can attain the knowledges, uh, abhinya. He had mentioned three knowledges, uh, and from there uh, he can become liberated. Uh, it's nearly one hour, maybe we stop here. Anything to discuss? one of the exceptions. Actually, in the uh, Vinaya books, uh, uh, this rain's retreat uh, was first observed by external ascetics, not by the Buddha's uh, disciples. And then uh, the, during the rains, uh, the Buddha's disciples was 
were walking all around. And then the uh, lay people criticized the Buddha's uh, disciples uh, for walking around during the rains uh, because they said uh, during the rains uh, a lot of uh, insects and uh, uh, worms, etc., they come up to the surface. Uh, and then when the monks walk around, uh, they kill all these uh, insects and uh, worms, etc. And then uh, because of their criticism, uh, then the Buddha also instructed the monks uh, to follow and keep the rains retreat. Yes, yes. Yes. As we find in the uh, Vinaya that uh, the Buddha was quite tolerant. There were a lot of monks uh, who do not uh, uh, fulfill the training. Uh, he, he did not uh, chase them out. <laughs> Yes, uh, it is not such a big offense la, because initially the Buddha did not have this training rule la, and the monks were uh, going on arms round la, in the morning, in the afternoon, even at night. Uh, later you'll see another sutta uh, where this is mentioned, uh, maybe the next sutta. La, uh, uh, yeah, the next Sutta, six, Sutta 66, uh, which we'll, we'll go through tomorrow. Uh, and the monks were uh, going on Armstrong at odd hours. Uh, and that created problems. Uh, sometimes in the darkness, uh, they are standing there. You know, when the monk begs for food, uh, he's not supposed to open his mouth. Uh, not supposed to say anything. Uh. So, uh, in the next Sutta, you will hear uh, about some lady. Uh, she was trying to get water from the well or something. And this monk was standing beside her keeping very quiet, and when she turned around, she saw him, she screamed in terror, la. and after that scolded him. <laughs> so, so that's why the Buddha uh, uh, didn't want the monks to go and bathe at night and all that, la. frighten people and inconvenience people and all that. Uh, and also, uh, the Buddha himself was quite ascetic, la. we know, uh, before he was enlightened, I, he practiced all the ascetic practices uh, to the extreme uh, until he nearly died. Uh, and eventually, I uh, decided to take one meal a day uh, and he felt uh, that it was enough. Uh. Actually, for a monk, uh, one meal a day is a very good practice uh, because uh, unless a monk does a lot of physical work, uh, you know, like building and all that, uh, then uh, a lot of monks, we don't do much physical work. Uh, then one meal a day is just nice. Uh, in fact, uh, for a lot of monks, uh, if we take two full meals, uh, you can easily get fat. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, so we have to be careful. Uh. We have to be careful. We don't uh, go out of shape. Uh. So this... Uh, this uh, eating uh, precept uh, is actually not a serious precept uh, because initially the Buddha allowed. Uh, but because the Buddha felt uh, that by eating one meal a day, uh, it is sufficient. And a monk uh, is slim. Uh, slim and uh, that's good uh, for meditation. If a monk gets fat, uh, then he gets uh, sleepy easily, uh, sloth and topper. Uh, so... Uh, it is a good practice only you know, because it helps in the uh, holy life. That's why the Buddha mentioned one meal a day. But later, because some monks could not uh, follow it, uh, then the Buddha relaxed a bit. Uh, and the Buddha said, uh, after the, the meal, uh, you can keep some food left over to eat later, but not after noon uh, when the sun is at the highest. Uh, and Actually, the main point the Buddha wanted uh, was that uh, the monk should only go on arms round once uh, and not inconvenience lay people uh, by going on arms round more than once a day. Uh. Uh, so, 
the monk goes on arms round once a day, and then if he wants to eat twice, uh, uh, that is allowable, provided it's in the morning. Okay. No, definitely not. So the Vinaya books uh, contain a lot of things uh, not mentioned in the suttas. You have to study it to know. Uh. So it is available, you just have to order it uh, from either Pali Tech Society or India. Say again. The Buddha is not a man who uses his mind and thinks a lot. So the Buddha, he does not go and think this problem is going to arise or that problem is going to arise. He just let things go naturally. Not like us. Before something arises, we are already worrying. Buddha does not worry about it. Whatever happens, uh, the Buddha said, uh, his mind is thus, uh, such, sometimes he translated it as such, unmoving, uh, his mind is un always unmoving, he's not disturbed by anything. Whatever happens, uh, it's just like everything is like a dream only. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I would translate, uh, actually the Pali word is asava. I would translate it as uncontrolled mental outflows. Uh, arahan is described, is, is uh, defined, uh, arahan, a uh, liberated uh, person, uh, is defined as a kinna sava, one who has destroyed the asavas. Uh, so, and we know, uh, and arahan, uh, he, uh, has, this, has destroyed uh, the tendency for the six consciousness to flow. Uh, so that's why this word asava, uh, I will interpret it uh, as the uncontrolled mental outflows. Uh, that means the flow of the six consciousness, uh, the tendency of the six consciousness to flow. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, this is the ultimate. Uh, if you destroy the asavas, uh, you the detains. Uh, you have become uh, Arahant. Yes, like uh, when the mind is disturbed, uh, the, the consciousness flows more, uh, there's a proliferation of thoughts. This proliferation of thoughts you can consider it as the asavas. But ultimately, uh, ultimately this asavas refers to the tendency of the mind to flow. The tendency of the mind to flow. Yes. Yes, yes. But when a, a monk has attained the jhanas, uh, when a monk has attained the jhanas, uh, the mind is focused. When the mind is focused, uh, the asavas do not flow. Uh, the asavas do not flow in the state of the jhanas because the mind is focused. 
concentrated. You are in control of the mind. So if you want to attain liberation, which is basically uh, uh, destruction of the, of the outflows, uh, you must be able to attain the jhanas, because when you attain the jhanas, uh, you stop the outflows for the, for the period you are in the jhana. If you are able to attain jhana for one hour, then at least uh, you can stop the asavas for one hour. You can attain for two hours, you can stop the asavas for two hours. And then only you have hope uh, of permanently uh, cutting off the asavas. If you cannot even cut it off for, uh, for, for a short while, you absolutely have no hope uh, of cutting it off permanently. That is why the vipassana meditation without the jhanas, uh, is, uh, there is no hope uh, of attaining liberation in the Buddha's teachings. Okay, shall we stop here? Sorry, sorry.